Okay, so did someone steal the clicker? Okay. Thank you for having me. Whoa, that's loud. Thank you for having me today. Um, this, you know, one of our researchers that was shown up there earlier, Jay Radcliffe, one of his favorite lines is from the great philosopher Mike Tyson, which is uh, everybody has a, a plan until they get hit in the face. Um, I've changed my mind a few times in the last uh, couple hours, and I, I, I think today's a very, very special thing, and there's a lot of very nuanced points to try to make here. To Bo's point, we want to raise the alarm without being alarmist. We want to compel corrective action. The truth is, um, just because it's scary doesn't mean it isn't true. And there's some fairly scary things um, that have been happening. Um, I wear a couple hats. I'm probably going to have to explain some after that intro. But um, one thing I'd like to frame very early is there is a real promise and apparel kind of an equation here. And we adopt technologies that are immediate and obvious benefits. And I, I think it's undeniable to this room all of the breakthroughs and advances in the quality of care, the affordability of care, the, the kind of diseases we couldn't treat before that we're now solving. Um, and just to punctuate how seriously we take that promise in peril, um, I'm going to get a bit personal for a minute. Um, part of the origin story of the cavalry, which I will gloss over, is um, I lost my mother to a very aggressive and very untreatable uh, brain cancer, uh, glioblastoma. It was pretty traumatizing to lose her at such a young age. And when I look at the work that people are doing in medical breakthroughs, and when I look at the promise of precision medicine, then I know that things like that that currently take our loved ones from us we have a chance to take a dent out of. We have a chance to fix these things. I'm inspired by things like the cancer moonshot. I'm inspired by 21st century cures. I desperately want this kind of breakthrough, and I want to make sure that we do our part to enable that. So I have a very personal stake in caring about the promise of this. I also know that because of our overdependence on undependable things, if we're cavalier about the risks, we will postpone or delay or shatter that promise. If anyone retreats from these otherwise superior technologies out of fear, we could self-inflict more harm from that fear. And that's the hard part of this job. The hard part is we have to raise that alarm without being alarmist. We have to take these things seriously and compel corrective action, and we have to lean into them before the true failure. We often say it's not the loss of life itself that's the real failure here. A failure condition in cyber policy for connected medicine is anything that triggers a crisis of confidence in the public, that triggers, uh, that could affect a fifth to a sixth of our GDP, that could cause a retreat or retraction from otherwise superior methods. Uh, and our response as a nation, depending on some of the things I'll show you, could be measured in blood and treasure and a compromise of our core values. Um, this is too serious of a topic for us to be cavalier or hope it just doesn't happen to us. Hope is not a strategy, and we've been on borrowed time for some time. This is almost a subprime mortgage crisis situation. So we like to talk about um, wherever bits and bites meet flesh and blood, it commands our attention. So um, I'm a little off script already because everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, but Brief note on I Am the Cavalry. So while Bo Woods and I had you know, left our private sector jobs a little over a year ago to go into the nonprofit think tank, the Atlantic Council, who's partnered uh, with everyone today, um, it's really uh, this last year in the think tank world is really year four of a journey we started uh, with I Am the Cavalry. Part of the experience of losing my mother did two things for me. It crystallized what was important to me, what mattered, and it also made me hyper-conscious of time and how little time we have and I didn't want to waste time anymore. So part of the recognition was we looked high and low in the government for the adults in the room, the people that would fix these things. I was deeply concerned about our dependence on connected technology, uh, specifically in areas affecting public safety and human life, and we got as high and deep as one could get. We found the, the adults, and the truth was they couldn't do anything to fix these things. There was no political will, there was no public consciousness, they didn't feel empowered. It really wasn't on their radars. Who would ever hack somebody to take life? No one would ever do that. Clearly that can't be possible. 
Clearly, we're not that dumb. So when we realized that the cavalry isn't coming, the empowering part was if, if, if the cavalry isn't coming, it falls to you, it falls to us, to be that voice of reason, that translator, that ambassador, to be a helping hand instead of a pointing finger, to be focused on future success, not past failure. And what we said to the room is, if you wanna be a part of the solution, then make a personal commitment and declaration that I will be part of that solution. And instead of just constantly arguing or fighting with FDA, we said, let's treat them as a teammate. Let's take a multi-stakeholder approach. Let's fuzz the chain of influence. And let's use our hacking skills not for technology, but for hearts and minds and for policy. In a benevolent and honest and forthright way, we wanted to try something different. So that is the origin of the, the I'm the Cavalry idea. And over the last four years, we've been stumbling and fumbling. If we ever write a memoir, it's going to be we have no idea what we're doing, and it seems to be working pretty well. But the truth is, while we are doing great things, and while eventually we will figure this out after some high consequence failures, the goal was always to be safer sooner, and we thought we could do that if we worked together. So you're gonna hear safer sooner together quite a bit. Now, let me uh, shift really quickly. Does anybody know what this picture is? I know Penny does, okay. So during our launch, we said, um, I want the whole room to understand people will have to die before anyone will listen to us. We weren't trying to be dramatic, we were trying to be adult. We said we're gonna have to have a high consequence failure before we'll see substantive change. And many of the hackers that had tried to warn the automotive industry or the medical device industry or industrial control systems, they had just banged their head against the wall for years. And it's not that they didn't have the technical prowess, it's that they lacked the social skills and the empathy required. So we used the metaphor of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. This river near where the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now stands caught on fire, not once, not twice, but over 20 times over a 70 year period before there was finally the right picture at the right time in, in the magazine, Time Magazine. And people got fed up with the idea that you have a burning river on fire. Maybe we should do something about pollution. And shortly thereafter you saw the Clean Water Act and then shortly after that you saw the formation of the EPA. So we keep saying we have to wait for a really bad thing to happen and we've tried to set expectations that actually we're probably gonna have to see very long list of very bad things to happen to build the political will. So we're not waiting for a, a Pearl Harbor or a 9-11 type event, we're waiting for our cyber Cuyahoga moment. And over the last year, we've had several candidates. So for a long, long time, we've been able to demonstrate the art of the possible that industrial control systems and power grids were vulnerable and no one did anything. They said, well, it's never happened yet. The problem is when you wait for things that have never happened yet, even though you can demonstrate them, the long response times can be measured in decades, especially for some of these very old, very brittle, very expensive pieces of equipment. But last year, we had our first public confirmation in the Ukrainian attacks on the power grids. And now we're scrambling to figure out how do we cost effectively harden our systems against similar attacks. We also saw Iranian hackers and others and unsealed documents from the Department of Justice showing proof of evidence that people were tampering with industrial control systems like water facilities in upstate New York. Now these are previously sealed documents and are only unsealing small numbers of them, but we keep saying, well, no one would do this, or clearly that's not possible. But last year we finally saw a public confirmation of the existence proof of people with the means, motive, and opportunity to manipulate a dam. But the one that really affected me the most was already mentioned this morning, which was Hollywood Presbyterian got compromised by accident. A single software flaw and a single device was sufficient to take out patient care where they had to divert ambulances to other facilities, cancel operations, degrade and de delayed and degraded patient care delivery for the better part of a week. And when I saw this, I said, it was a material moment for me because I said if an accident could take out a hospital, what could Trick do? And I know you don't know who Trick is, but you're about to. So this was actually the moment when Bo and I decided to leave our private sector jobs and go full on into trying to accelerate um, cyber safety policy at a national and international level. Um, you know, most of our people in this room are medical professionals or studying to be, so you spend an awful lot of time in hospitals, but a hospital is the last place someone wants to be, right? But some of the most important moments of your life are there. You're watching a loved one uh, get treated for a serious disease. You're waiting for some some dreadful test results, you're seeing the birth of your child, you're saying goodbye to a loved one. Uh, maybe you're in need of an emergency surgery or something in the ER and you have to wait for hours and hours and hours. It's not a place people like to or want to be. I had to go recently as well. But uh, 
when you're doing that, time really matters. And the notion that if you're in an ambulance and you're told you have to go across LA traffic where seconds may matter, this is not the kind of fragility we want in the system. So let me explain who Trick is. For many, many years before I got into working with government, um, I studied the rise of hacktivism in Anonymous. Does anyone know that picture, the, uh, the Guy Fox mask? One of the reasons I studied them is I thought this was a very troubling development. Most hacking had previously required a lot of skill, and it previously was very predictable. It was very economically, rationally motivated attackers. In the course of studying them, I was very concerned not about anonymous themselves, because they were mostly pranksters, aside from taking out Children's Hospital in Boston, um, but they had a pretty benign impact. It was mostly sound and fury signifying very little, but I was much more worried about what would come next. In fact, at the time, uh, we had said this is less about anonymous, it's more the blueprint they represent, and that blueprint will be adopted and perfected by others. And one of the examples of that um, that we were very worried about came true shortly after we finished our research. So that's the blueprint graphic that we talked about for a year and a half of public writing where we were describing and shaping uh, what that movement may become. Well, sometime afterwards, there wasn't even an ISIS when we first discussed it, but it's very clear if you've watched the news that ISIS has really perfected the blueprint pioneered by Anonymous, the use of social media, the use of Facebook, for, so, for propaganda, for recruiting, uh, for coordination. In fact, the US is really reeling from the fact that we invented social media, but our most existential adversary is the one that's ma masterfully out maneuvering us in that space. So we didn't actually specifically mean that someone would leave anonymous and join an extremist group. But to my dread, uh, a few months prior to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital, uh, there was a con confirmed drone strike on the first hacker in history. One of the hackers from Anonymous, from the UK, a very brilliant guy named Junaid Hussein, he went by the handle of Trick. Anonymous actually globally had very, very, very few hackers. But one of the hacking crews was called Team Poison. Uh, he was successful enough of a hacker to successfully hack Tony Blair's web infrastructure and go to prison for it. And sometime after getting out of prison, he moved from Birmingham, UK to Raqqa, Syria. He founded what's known as the Cyber Caliphate. He was training and recruiting people uh, to do physical attacks in the US, like the Garland, Texas cartoon shootings. Uh, but he was also had the means, motive, and opportunity to use basic rudimentary hacking tools to hack really simple stuff. Not the most talented hacker in the world, but talented enough to take human life. So my first instinct when I saw Hollywood Presbyterian is, thank God Trick's dead. Now there's a CNN documentary on this about the life and death of Trick. It's finally come out, but very few people realize you know, how someone could go from a, an otherwise suburban existence into the number three most dangerous man in ISIS and meriting a drone strike. And I'd like to say that taking him out took out the entire Sour Caliphate, but he had recruited and trained enough people that they're still active. And it's one of the, the, the most pressing concerns I have because I don't think a ransomware crew is gonna try to kill people. Um, I'm much more concerned about accidents and, and th these kinds of adversaries than I am about nation states or, or financial crime. So in the context of Hollywood Presbyterian, it's not so much that I thought one hospital was gonna be a big deal. We were worried in the task force, um, the HHS task force just wrapped up, our final report came out on Friday after a year plus of fairly intense meetings. But at our very first meeting, I said, are there any technical barriers to a sustained denial of patient care on any or all US hospitals. Because in the case of Hollywood Presbyterian, they simply diverted people up the street. They were able to handle the surge capacity with other facilities. But there's really nothing stopping someone from hitting every hospital in the region. And sadly, which we're gonna get to in a second, some of our fears came true just a few weeks ago with WannaCry. So with 65K, excuse, excuse me, 65, minimum of UK hospitals shutting down patient care, canceling surgeries, canceling procedures. And at that kind of volume, it's much harder to handle overflow capacity. So my bigger fear isn't that the attack will happen. We have a certainty these types of attacks will happen. Our bigger fear is that our response time will be terrible. It'll be like the deep water horizon. We're concerned that when this happens, the crisis of confidence won't be briefed with a prompt and agile response. It'll be on the news every night because we really don't have the technical measures in place, we don't have the security staff in place to have an elegant response. 
Uh, many of us in the government are treating uh, the WannaCry attacks as a near miss. We got very, very lucky. But we also know that our luck is running out. Now, one way to put this without using too much jargon, and I need a much better graphic, is when you talk to the international policy community where Bo and I are doing more work now, when they talk about cybersecurity, they're thinking about nation states like Russia or China or um, others that have a standing army. And they try to use things like economic sanctions and deterrence models and mutually assured destruction and norms and treaties. They try to use these deterrence things and they assume the adversaries are deterrable. And right now, offense is so much easier than defense that we never even try to invest in defense or resilience of our critical systems. We just hope that no one would do it. And what I've been trying to remind them of is it's not just the level of difficulty. Like, why would they bother doubling or tripling our defense if the Russians can hack us anyhow, right? The problem is they've forgotten the other axis, which is intent. So if you take away the vertical axis, you know, what if you have these high intent, low capability adversaries? like Trick, like Lone Wolves, like someone who wants to hurt people. And the, the goal here is not to boil the ocean and not to make hospitals immune to cyber attack. The goal is to raise our defensive cyber hygiene sufficiently high enough that we exhaust the capabilities of these high intent, low capability adversaries. And these are basic 80-20 rule things, like the fact that WannaCry was successful even though it had a patch available from Microsoft in March. In theory, that was an entirely avoidable thing with cyber hygiene. The problem is basic hygiene is not very easy, especially when we're understaffed to do so. So the goal being, if you can raise that tide line and focus on these low uh, skill but high intent cap uh, actors, we can maybe make ourselves more resilient to any form of accidents and adversaries. So we're not trying to have an overwhelming message that should put people in despair. We just have to be strong enough to handle the these more motivated adversaries. And when you put this in the context of other things like the Internet of Things, and uh, part of the task force meeting, we had a public meeting the week before, excuse me, just after a major Internet attack that took out half the Internet for an entire Friday. Uh, this was a, an IoT botnet. We, we said it was a tsunami of technical debt because all these low-cost, low-hygiene video cameras on the Internet were compromised because they had default passwords that they were unpatchable, and they were roped into this zombie horde that basically overwhelmed anyone's ability to stop the flood of denial of service attack, just through lots and lots and lots of packets at internet servers. And things like CNN were down, things like Spotify and Netflix couldn't operate, and there was a lot of lost revenue. So this caught the attention of uh, people concerned with our economy. But what much to my delight, Suzanne Schwartz at the FDA, on her remarks on stage at our, our public event at HHS, she pointed out, you know, we have to take a hard look at what are the risks of something like the Mirai botnet for medical institutions. And my first thoughts were twofold. Number one, there's nothing stopping that large, unstoppable, unfixable botnet from aiming at health delivery organizations right now. They just pick a target and they flood it with packets. And given how fragile and brittle our systems are and how the best banks in the world can't stop these attacks, what hope do our electronic health records or our cloud-based IT systems have? So healthcare could be a target and a victim of something like these large unstoppable botnets. But moreover, if you think of the three defining characteristics that enabled this particular unstoppable botnet to happen, it was hard-coded, fixed, unchangeable credentials or login, username, and password unpatchable, and directly connected to the internet. Now, I just described the lion's share of medical appliances and medical devices, especially when some of these manufacturers require you to have a remote backdoor for maintenance. In fact, if you try to change the password for some, as, as Scott and others have tried to do, uh, you void your maintenance contract. So a norm of behavior makes it so that not only could hospitals be the next target of a large unstoppable botnet, but they may actually com comprise the next large unstoppable botnet. And what's really scary is a lot of the private sector responses to these ideas is, well, if, a, if we can't patch it and we can't fix it and we can't take it offline, let's just destroy the device. We'll send hacking commands at it and we'll destroy it, which is one thing when it's an $85 video camera. It's another entirely when it's a multi-million dollar medical device or when it's a bedside infusion pump in a NICU. And Bo and I have been doing a lot of scenarios and simulations, and perhaps you'll see some tomorrow, where we're running scenarios where people had as unintended collateral damage taken out hospitals in their response. 
So we want to make sure that in this over-dependence on undependable things, we've really factored in not just the targeted attacks from someone like Trick, but the accidents, the unintended consequences, the collateral damage of very large, wide-sweeping attacks like WannaCry. So specific to that as well, and thank goodness it didn't take root, but everyone says, well, who cares if they ransom our files if we have good backups? Or who cares if they send a denial of service attack? You know, the storm will pass. But what they don't realize is ransomware is not the only thing we should be afraid of. The very vulnerabilities that allow ransomware to happen or allow your system to be roped into a botnet that attacks other people. There was an attack called Brickerbot, and brick is a term of art in our industry where you render something permanently damaged. Now, this particular bot said, I'm not gonna use it for financial gain. If I find a vulnerable system, I'm just gonna destroy it. So how would you like to see property damage of any or all of your Hospira infusion pumps or any or all of your multi-year uh, investments in imaging systems? And these are not easy to replace. They're not cheap to replace. And if you were replacing them, you would replace them with equally vulnerable technologies until we do something to fix that. Now, as we were discussing all these threats for things like a Mirai in healthcare or things like a Bricker bot, and working deeply with industrial control systems, CERT at, at DHS, working with FDA, and working with other stakeholders, um, our worst fear came true. You've heard it mentioned a few times today, but we've been preparing for and dreading for years that a large attack would have a profound impact on healthcare. And WannaCry, without targeting healthcare whatsoever, this piece of ransomware took out 65 UK hospitals in a single day uh, that were confirmed. We've had impact in the US, but we've been more tight-lipped about where and for how long and for how bad. Um, but the US in general got very, very lucky. I can show a graphic as to why. And while it wasn't very sophisticated, it mostly wanted money, and it wasn't even targeting healthcare, it was sufficient enough to cause cancellations. And I'm not gonna read all these to you, but there were statements from NHS, perhaps you've seen them. There were a few social media things, though, from doctors and nurses, and there's a pretty compelling video from a nurse saying, please don't come to our facility unless you really, really have to come, please don't come. Uh, but people were almost certain that the delayed procedures, the degraded uh, care delivery, absolutely had a, a loss of life. Some of them used curse words I had to block out. Um, and we don't want to scare people, but these are the things that we dread, that Bo and I talk about as a potential crisis of confidence moment. Because if the response to that attack, or the fear of another attack like that, leads to us retracting, or our general counselors and our legal people, or our chief medical officers, or physicians being reluctant to prescribe something uh, because they no longer trust it, that's the real harm. Now, we don't want to blindly push through that. That's where this, the hard work comes in. Now, you won't be able to read these numbers, but that huge orange block, this is essential internet exposure by country for the WannaCry attack. It used a flaw in Microsoft that's been patchable since March. It's had a fix available, but no one's bothered to fix it. The US is that big orange one at 330,000 residual. Now, every other country on that map, we, uh, our friends over at Rapid7 are checking this on a daily basis. Every other country is sh sh shrinking their squares. For some reason, the US didn't get the message of WannaCry. Now, these are not all hospitals. These are all systems in the US. But every single one of them could be roped into the next version of this thing. And while the US was mostly spared through some luck on a couple of fronts, uh, we still haven't had that compelling moment to trigger the political will and the courage to have the corrective actions. So there's really nothing stopping us from being hit right now. Now, I'm gonna try to do this quickly and briefly. We weren't even sure if we can include it because we had some delayed release of this report, but uh, Congress had asked for a one-year task force with 20 very diverse voices. Uh, they asked HHS to facilitate it, and they wanted us to, to look uh, and answering six very hard questions um, on the security of the overall healthcare industry. And this graphic is on one of the first pages of the report. Um, I will give people a very high resolution version if they want, but of the many uncomfortable truths we encountered, what we realized is strictly answering those, five, those six questions for Congress failed to really capture the gravitas. None of us knew that WannaCry was gonna happen, so WannaCry really put a punctuation mark at the end of this sentence. But the, 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 the consensus of the group is that healthcare cybersecurity is in critical condition. And of the 13 or so unique reasons, we picked the top five. And without reading these verbatim, uh, these uncomfortable truths make our response very, very hard. 
And solving any one of these, these are wicked problems. These are multi-layered problems, which will take a lot of time, a lot of will, and a lot of money, in some cases, to remediate. But the first and the most foundational is that there's a severe lack of security talent in, in modern healthcare. If you look at the annual breakdowns by size, um, the overwhelming majority of health delivery organizations in the US are small and medium and rural. Uh, the top two categories are nine employees or fewer or 10, uh, 20 employers or fewer. And when we interviewed most of them, they don't even have a single IT person on staff, let alone an IT security person. Um, and as we see the average kind of uh, spread of qualified security talent, it's pretty anemic. And what that means is if we're asking them to do assessments against the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, or if we're asking them to receive threat intelligence when the next WannaCry is happening, and we're asking them to prioritize assets and keep them off the internet if they're safety critical, there's really no one there that knows how to receive or interpret those in a lot of cases. And they do their best with the native indigenous staff. We've seen a lot of nurse practitioners fill the role of a designated information security officer for HIPAA. But HIPAA was focused on our data, uh, but not our life and limb. And uh, in the cavalry early on, we made a deliberately worded joke that we love our privacy, but we'd like to be alive to enjoy it. And it was very much in the crosshairs of this task force that we wanted to make sure we thought about the public safety uh, uh, aspects of this. So if number one, there's, uh, it's our belief, there's no census yet, but it's our belief that of 85% of the health delivery organizations in the US lack a single qualified security person on staff, not even one. So it is by luck that they'll, they'll actually be resilient in the face of these next wave of attacks. Number two, we're trying to, even if they had a massive team, we're trying to defend much, much older legacy equipment. These are running, it's common to see Windows XP as a best case scenario, and not only has Windows XP been end of life by Microsoft, its successor, Windows Vista, has now been end of life. So we are several generations behind active support. They're harder to defend, they're more porous, they lack modern countermeasures. And if we continue to depend on these things, we're gonna be significantly more exposed than, say, banks would be. And just as a sobering moment, 100 of the Fortune 100 companies have lost intellectual property and trade secrets. Every single one of them. And everybody that protects your credit card has failed to do so. Most of you had to replace your credit card several times. So what we, the dirty secret of cybersecurity is our failure rate is 100%. And who in a million years would depend on life and limb use cases for something we don't yet know how to secure. Software is one of the most vulnerable things ever invented by man. And it's one thing when we're losing a credit card, it's another when we're losing some trade secrets. But thus far, those, those failures have not been consequential enough. But now we're depending on where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood, and this is why we're so motivated and concerned. So that legacy equipment, uh, the best team from Bank of America couldn't defend that old legacy stuff. So one idea is we're gonna have to drain the swamp of a lot of that legacy IT and do an IT refresh. Number three, uh, this is almost the government's fault a little bit. I'm gonna say this with some love. It was well-intentioned, and of course there were benefits from high-tech and meaningful use requirements. But in our rush to get from paper records to electronic health records, we took systems that were never designed to be connected to anything, and we forced them to be connected to everything, and we tied financial incentives to this. So you both had to get on EMRs, and we connected these systems that were never threat modeled for internet-facing use cases. And what this has ultimately led to is premature connectivity, which has obvious benefits, has led to very flat, unsegmented, wide-open networks that are often exposed to the internet, and moreover, that allows the cascading failures so that a single flaw in a single system can affect patient care for an entire hospital. Which gets to number three, which is we were originally talking about, excuse me, number four, which is uh, that these vulnerabilities can affect patient care. It's not simply that you're gonna have an outage or a delay in getting checked out. It's that you may not be able to deliver patient care at all. Our, our poster children for this were Hollywood Presbyterian. NHS in the UK shut down four hospitals in November, another batch in January, but the real one that everyone's seen now is the 65K, the 65 uh, hospitals that we referred to. And then lastly, um, the really bad news is many of these devices give you ample opportunity to have that. So if a single flaw in a single device could take out Hollywood Presbyterian, um, it's not uncommon to find a medical technology that has over 1,000 of those security vulnerabilities. So it's a bit of an epidemic. Uh, there's one specific one that was found to have 1,400. Now that's the bad news of that particular thing. 
But the good news is the manufacturer, even though that device was uh, not technically an FDA device, and even though it was technically past its end of support, they said, we're going to fix it. And it took updating seven packages of software to fix and remove 1,400 exploitable vulnerabilities. So they tried to show through leadership that just because we have terrible hygiene in these things doesn't mean that we shouldn't fix them or that we can't fix them. And much like we went many, many years in healthcare not knowing we should scrub in before a surgery for post-op infections, we've gone many, many years now not realizing that there's some level of hygiene required. As we have more dependence and as technology plays an increasing role in addition to biology and chemistry, we have to be very clear uh, that there's a level of cyber hygiene required to, to reap those benefits. So if you tie these together, the really sobering realization here is 85% or more of these organizations don't have a single person on staff. If they did, they're defending harder to defend things. Uh, these are overconnected to each other and the outside world, increasing the blast radius of any single compromise, which means a single flaw and a single device can take out a hospital, and the average device gives you maybe a thousand chances to do so. So we consider this situation to be unsustainable. And that's the bad news. Now the good news is some really smart people talk to hundreds of you and several trade organizations, and we put together some pretty bold recommendations on how to start digging into these wicked problems. Now, one of the things that's unpopular and meant to be provocative is everyone saying well, there's no money. We can't hire a single person. We fought for months over should we require, or should we ask Congress to require a single, at least one qualified security person per organization. And no one on the task force thought that that was going to be realistic. Even one security person, they thought that was a bridge too far, that razor thin margins, some of these rural facilities would close down if we impose any additional cost on them. And it's just more meant to be a question, but if we can't afford to protect it, why do we think we can afford to connect it? You know, I would like to, you know, maybe drive a, an 18 wheeler, but I'm not qualified to do it in a safe way. I have to demonstrate competence and training to be able to handle that machinery. I might want to become a surgeon because there's a dearth of surgeons available for some of these things, but I can't do a three day boot camp on a weekend and be qualified to be a surgeon. So, what we may need to start to ra rationalize is which of our connected breakthroughs can we reasonably afford to deploy and depend upon? And, and we haven't figured that out, but there's some early ideas about how to rationalize the fact that we're probably upside down on our mortgages. This is very much like a subprime mortgage crisis. But we have to start grappling with the fact that these are target rich, resource poor environments, and that if we can't afford to protect it, why are we connecting it? So one of the things we've tried to do instead of beating that pointing finger is, uh, you know, Bo, I want to make sure I clarify what Bo said earlier about that we're hacking policy. We are not maliciously hacking policy. We're using trust brick by brick, earning it, uh, interfacing with stakeholders, making sure we speak the same language. The idea of terraforming is that we're trying to create compatible, breathable oxygen for each other. We didn't speak the same language, or rather we use the same words for different meanings. And at the heart of building that trust is really leading with empathy. So it wasn't our technical prowess, it was that we tried to understand the environments and the constraints and the wants, needs, and fears of the various people we're interfacing with and walk a mile in their shoes. Now we will never be experts in each other's profession, but I think that's one of the reasons that Jeff and Christian are just so, so magical, a set of teammates here, is that we would never know how to put together the simulations you're gonna see later today. And a lot of the people that do know those, th those things would never know how to deal with some of the, the, the tech policy, the cybersecurity policy. So it's really the union and the fusion of those things together. Now, some of the